Hello. I am uh, glad to, to see you at our second uh, uh, Europe Planet Telescope uh, Network Science uh, Workshop. I am uh, Grazina Totvesheni from the Vilnius University in Lithuania, and uh, I will talk uh, about uh, uh, Europe Planet Telescope uh, Network for Exoplanetary Research. During uh, our first uh, Europlanet uh, Telescope Science uh, meeting, uh, which we had in 2022, we had uh, 210 participants uh, from 43 countries, from whom there were 33 early career researchers, uh, 80 amateurs, 22 educators, and 43 uh, senior researchers. If you are interested in the work of uh, done uh, or could be done on this uh, uh, telescope uh, network, uh, you will hear presentations uh, today and uh, uh, presentations from our first workshop uh, uh, can be found, uh, all, all recordings uh, here at, uh, at this uh, link. Presently, uh, this uh, network unites uh, 16 observatories uh, with uh, 24 telescopes in 12 uh, countries and the Falkes telescope network with uh, 21 te telescopes uh, in v various uh, places uh, uh, in the world. And uh, all the information uh, about uh, the telescopes uh, uh, how uh, they give uh, observational time uh, about the instrumentation possibilities uh, is uh, service uh, motor present or not uh, and uh, some telescopes also give uh, some number nights uh, free of charge about accommodation uh, possibilities and contact persons uh, all this information uh, is uh, provided uh, on uh, the uh, web page uh, of uh, this network, uh, and here is a direct uh, link uh, to, to this uh, table. If you wish to plan your observations, you can choose uh, which telescope uh, is uh, for you uh, suitable most of all. Up, up to now, uh, uh, we already granted uh, 187 observing nights uh, for applicants and uh, uh, applications uh, can come fr not just from professional astronomers but uh, from amateur astronomers as well and uh, all observatories are very helpful uh, they provide, uh, how to say, advices uh, and all necessary help for amateurs. And today you will hear maybe uh, comments on that <laughs> from our amateurs who already were working. There will be several presentations by, by them. And uh, this uh, project uh, will not uh, be forever, uh, so I encourage uh, to send uh, your applications uh, and the deadline is the end of this year. So your opp last opportunity <laughs> to use uh, freely this uh, network and uh, the application uh, form is uh, very simple, uh, just three pages. The first page for your information, like name, uh, uh, institution, uh, gender, uh, and other things, and uh, uh, two more pages uh, just for what you would like to observe. And uh, uh, our committee does not know who is applying, uh, and uh, they give evaluation for the application. However, another committee 
uh, who accept the final decision, they take into account uh, was application uh, from professional or from amateur applicant and uh, uh, amateurs uh, uh, can uh, receive time with lower marks. So here is uh, the link to the call of uh, observations where you can uh, find all the information and uh, I think that uh, this is a very good opportunity now uh, to go to those observatories because uh, several years we had uh, this pandemic uh, period and uh, people were not able to travel uh, and uh, because of that we developed service uh, observations. Uh, almost all observatories provide also service observations if you have no time to go. So I think very favorable conditions uh, for making uh, research in this uh, network. So this our workshop uh, was divided into three parts. Uh, the first day you already Yet, uh, was what is uh, going on with observations of uh, solar planetary system objects. Uh, today, I will talk a, a little about possibilities of exoplanet uh, research uh, using telescopes of this network. And uh, tomorrow, there will be a session uh, related to asteroids, uh, comets, and other small bodies uh, uh, of the solar system. So you are welcome to attend to all those uh, three sessions. So it is possible uh, to do with uh, the available telescopes very interesting uh, research of uh, exoplanet transits. Uh, sometimes uh, uh, space missions, uh, they do not finish fully observations of uh, transits, so they should be observed from Earth. And for some uh, missions, uh, they ask uh, to, they select uh, objects of interest and uh, uh, encourage uh, people to observe transits uh, of those uh, objects and uh, prepare better for space observations. And uh, here, for example, there are examples uh, of transit observations uh, on several telescopes and different uh, observatories, uh, which may cover longer period, uh, several uh, transit uh, passes. Uh, so far, we did not have applications for more, how to say, advanced uh, investigations uh, from those uh, transit observations. It is possible also to take into account uh, when transit goes uh, through the spot on, on the sun, uh, there are some changes uh, in the spectrum because of, because of that. For example, here we can see or uh, fecula also have a Im impact to to the, to the transit. So maybe somebody will be interested to investigate uh, this kind of research. Those who already observe simple transits, maybe you already go to the next step <laughs> in, in this research. So here there were examples made by professional astronomers, uh, but uh, we have uh, very many observations uh, by, um, made by amateur astronomers. Uh, and here I should uh, say that uh, ExoClock uh, project, uh, the website, is very useful in this field. Uh, they provide objects of interest and uh, people may select uh, which uh, they would like to observe, uh, to select the observatory. And here are examples of, 
of some uh, such observations, uh, those results uh, go to this uh, ExoClock uh, website and will be useful for Ariel and other space uh, missions. Another field of uh, investigations uh, uh, can be re related to planet uh, hosting stars. And uh, here uh, we have uh, uh, applications and uh, results uh, made by professional astronomers. And uh, now uh, it is found that uh, if a star has uh, uh, exoplanet uh, of sm small size or large exoplanet, uh, there is impact on the chemical composition of that star. And uh, astronomers investigate uh, how uh, this impact uh, depends on the condensation temperature of those chemical elements. And here there are some examples how uh, those slopes uh, in condensation temperature uh, depend on uh, the metallicity of the star, age of the star, uh, effective temperature or mass uh, of exoplanets uh, which uh, this uh, star uh, has. So this work uh, is uh, already out more, more advanced but uh, we will uh, make uh, this year uh, a summer school at the Molita Astronomical Observatory in Lithuania and uh, will teach uh, methods uh, how spectroscopically it is possible to investigate uh, exoplanet uh, hosting stars. Several uh, school, such schools already mm, were held uh, before, uh, some years ago as well. I am very glad uh, to see that uh, all those uh, observations uh, using the Europlanet Telescope Network uh, sometimes give even uh, papers uh, in journals uh, with uh, very high impact factor. Uh, the best uh, journals uh, in Europe, for example, like Astronomy and Astrophysics uh, hosts uh, our results and the monthly notices of the Royal Astronomical Society, Acta Astronomica, and of course, uh, observations of asteroids uh, go to minor planet uh, bulletins. So, as I told, uh, the project uh, is ending, uh, but uh, we hope that uh, this network uh, will survive. Uh, we will uh, uh, ask uh, observatories who would like uh, to remain in the network uh, so that uh, information on, on, possi on possibility how people can access them could be provided uh, in some coordinated place uh, and uh, what are conditions. And uh, those observatories which now are in the network, uh, they are, have not very large telescopes, uh, up to two meters, and the uh, hosts of those telescopes are quite friendly, and for the collaborative uh, projects, uh, they always are open to have common observations and uh, uh, to make uh, scientific investigations uh, together. So I will highlight several <laughs> observatories. Uh, today, uh, here in Slovakia, we have uh, several telescopes uh, available uh, and uh, would like to point your attention. Uh, uh, and at Skalnata Plesa Observatory, they renovated recently the telescopes and uh, they are quite high at uh, 1,700 uh, meters. Uh, there is a 1.3 meter telescope uh, which has both CCD camera and spectrograph, so both uh, types of research can be done. There is uh, also in Slovakia 61 centimeter telescope with uh, CCD photometer. Uh, applications uh, are welcome to the National 
astronomical observatory Rosen in, in Bulgaria, also high in, in the mountains. There is spectrograph and CCD camera. Several smaller telescopes have CCD camera. Uh, the Moleta Astronomical Observatory, which I am representing, has a 1.65 meter telescope uh, with the CCD uh, camera and also with a high resolution spectrograph of three resolving powers. So observations are welcome and uh, there is a smaller telescope by field uh, also can be used and is used for exoplanet uh, transit observations and uh, as I already told uh, we will have a, a summer school this year. Unfortunately all uh, on-site places already are occupied but uh, online participants still are welcome and here is uh, the link uh, to, to, to this summer school. Also, the presentations will be recorded, so you at any time can come. There are also materials from previous schools. There are quite often such schools, so you can gain experience. At the TART Observatory, there is 1.5 meter telescope also is waiting for uh, applications. It has a low resolution spectrograph uh, and uh, uh, transit observation could could be ma made uh, with smaller several smaller telescopes at the Konkoli observatory in Hungary there is one meter telescope uh, very good for asteroid and exoplanet transit observations so you are very welcome uh, to use this network and uh, to join observations in uh, the planetary research. Thank you for your attention. If uh, there is uh, one or two short questions I could answer. Yes, thank you for the very nice talk. Um, I'm wondering if um, university students can also apply uh, because I see the option of amateurs or uh, professionals, but what uh, about university students? Can they have the opportunity? So university students uh, can be considered as applicants so far they do not have a diploma. So they are amateurs. Okay. So, so they can apply. And also for this uh, wireless uh, telescope network, uh, educational programs can be accepted for free, even uh, though the price is quite high for, for observing time, but some educational uh, programs uh, they accept uh, for free. So you are welcome to, con to contact uh, this contact person, which is available in our table of telescopes and, and choir also. Perfect, thank you. And do we have uh, maybe online questions? Okay, so I uh, now would like uh, to go to the second hour presentation. Uh, that will be Edita Stonkute from the Vilnius University. And uh, she will talk about uh, spectroscopic observations of uh, uh, exoplanet hosting stars. So you will see more information about this. So good day, everyone. Um, I would like to present uh, our results um, from uh, uh, high resolution spectroscopic follow up of uh, hosts that uh, host planets and the candidates that are identified. Uh, uh, to be a potential host and this work is done together with uh, colleagues uh, from Vilnius University listed here. So uh, the field of uh, exoplanets uh, started uh, uh, in 1990s uh, when the first planets around the other stars than Sun, uh, the first planets uh, other than, than Sun was discovered 
Uh, and uh, to our surprises, uh, we did not expect it to find uh, hot Jupiter uh, uh, in an, in the orbit uh, uh, next to to uh, solar uh, solar type star. So up to today, we have more than five thousand known exoplanets, and uh, many more uh, are waiting for the confirmation. And here you see mass period distribution of uh, discovered exoplanets where different colors corresponds to different methods that been used to find those distant worlds. So we see that the field started with red dots with radial velocity detections of uh, warm Jupiters and then the transit method took over and we have all kinds of planets small and, uh, and large in size. And they might be orbiting stars very close in, in short uh, period orbits or, or far away. And to our surprise, uh, we see that uh, the field started with giant planets, but now we have a diverse, um, uh, diverse uh, range of exoplanets around different stars. So we have uh, uh, Neptune-like planets, uh, gas giants, and super Earth equally distributed in this uh, in this um, architecture chart and um, stars and, and planets are formed um, uh, at roughly the same time and from the same original gas and dust cloud so whether the planet formed due to the core accretion or due to the gravitational stability uh, we assume that the composition of the star and planet are linked. So we can use the uh, facilities we have both in space and ground-based to observe the hosts and learn more about the planets because we cannot observe directly the, the planet itself. Uh, the first row shows you the missions that are dedicated to exoplanets and the, the ones on the bottom is the missions that are sensitive to planet missions. And a lot of data that we learn about the chemistry of planets are coming from James Webb. But up till now, we also need a ground-based observatories to uh, nail the details about the host stars because we can only learn about planets when we know details about their host stars. And if we look at the uh, atmospheric metallicity versus planetary mass for the solar system, there is metallicity relative to a host star on the y-axis and the planet mass in Earth masses and in Jupiter mass. We kind of see the line where the smaller sized planets are more enhanced in 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 uh, in um, in metals than the larger larger ones, and uh, this chart will be filled with James uh, Webb space data. But up to now, we have to consider uh, some some things that uh, uh, chemistry of the planets are similar to the chemistry of the host stars, and it was shown that. Uh, giant planets and, met and the metallicity of the host stars is connected. Uh, in 2000, uh, in year 2000, uh, it's been shown by Santos, Fisher and Valente and many others that there is a higher stellar metallic metallicity uh, as indication of higher probability of giant planet detection. And then natural step was to move forward to see how about smaller size planets? How about Neptune-like planets? And in 2008, SAUSA demonstrated that uh, uh, Neptunes can be formed at any metallicity, but he has a, a very small sample of planet host at that time. And uh, on the y-axis is the metallicity of the host star. And later on, this uh, the same uh, um, uh, thing was confirmed by uh, other authors that uh, Neptunes really can be formed at any metallicity. Uh, now, with bigger bigger sample of uh, of uh, uh, planets, planet hosts. 
And the natural step was to look at the at the rocky worlds, at the, at the small size planets, to understand what kind of metallicity, metallicity relation of the host star is showing us about the rocky worlds. And here uh, was nice work done by Lars Buhave and collaborators. They analyzed uh, around 400 uh, hosts uh, that uh, has like 600 exoplanet candidates from Kepler sample. And they showed that uh, rocky planets can be formed at any metallicity because we can see the big scatter uh, in the metallicity plot on the y, uh, y axis. And um, uh, when we got uh, more and more confirmed exoplanets in the, in the, our field, uh, it started to, to uh, analyze, the scientists started to analyze the demographic of the, of the population. And it has been shown that metal-rich stars host a great diversity of planets. So the first figure shows you the metallicity on the x-axis and metal content of the host star and the planet per 100 uh, stars. And we see the models for uh, large planets like uh, Jupiter and Saturn and smaller one in green and blue. And we see that uh, planets larger than Neptune, uh, blue and yellow, uh, uh, preferentially found around metal rich stars. Okay. And smaller planets than Neptune are found um, preferentially around the wide range of metallicities. And we see the correlation for small planets uh, uh, um, uh, have positive metallicity correlation for short period, but there is no correlation for, for long period uh, 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 systems. And it being more steps to to figure out how this metallicity and um, and um, um, uh, host planet uh, uh, plays a role to planet formation and evolution. And a uh, few years ago, the began together with collaborators modeled how the iron content of protoplanetary disk. Um, um, uh, depends from the iron content of uh, rocky planets or vice versa. And uh, they show that the rocky exoplanet composition depends on the chemical composition of the host star, but this correlation for the rocky planet is not one-to-one, -one, as they show in their study. So for us, uh, doing uh, chemistry of the host star is interesting to see, are there any correlations to other chemical elements, not only looking at the iron as the metallicity of a star. And uh, Haywood and the Debian demonstrated that the um, alpha elements like uh, calcium, titanium, magnesium, shows the overabundance uh, uh, in planets' hosts. And later on, studies when we had more and more uh, um, uh, planet detected, analyzed the others, other species like carbon, oxygen, and uh, there were um, surveys showing uh, in 2017 that there is no correlation between stars with planets and stars without planets. Uh, the green and blue uh, dots are planet hosts, and the uh, Red is, uh, is a comparison sample without planets, and it's a mixture. You cannot say that carbon is more enhanced uh, in, uh, in planets host or, or not. But later on, the work by Delgado Mena, the same uh, group, uh, but with more data, showed that uh, the blue dots are somehow higher for, al for carbon, and blue dots correspond to smaller size planets in the system. So it seems that they found that uh, stars hosting uh, small, uh, small, small size planets are enhanced in carbon. So for us, it was interesting to see are there any distinction between planets hosts and, and not. Uh, so we initiated um, um, a, a follow up of known exoplanets and the candidates using the Europa Planet Telescope Network, and we are using the uh, um, 1.65 meter telescope at Moliette Observatory. It has three resolution modes and large spectral range that we can look at all like, many species that we can find in in uh, star spectra. And um, 
our preliminary results are that we selected um, from the test uh, space mission um, uh, bright stars that are magnitude uh, limited uh, with minimal, uh, if any, chemical composition uh, uh, about uh, those uh, uh, those hosts from high resolution studies, and we were awarded, as I mentioned, uh, 17 plus uh, 18 nights uh, with uh, with the telescope, thanks to Europlanet Telescope Network, and currently we are uh, uh, working on the data and still observing uh, uh, more stars. So uh, our uh, main idea is to generate a catalog of uniformly derived parameters that will contain atmospheric parameters for the host stars, temperature, surface gravity, metallicity, microturbulence, velocity. Also precise abundances using the same method for whole sample for more than uh, for around 24 species like uh, carbon, oxygen, magnesium, silicon, but even higher chemical elements like uh, barium, europium. Uh, we also derived ages and masses for the host stars and orbital parameters uh, as well as velocity components. And here we see uh, color, uh, temperature and uh, surface gravity uh, uh, diagram where you can see our results. So we have a population of planet hosts uh, who, who are uh, main sequence stars and, and uh, subdwarfs. Uh, uh, subgiants and and giants uh, and different kind of metallicities. So here I'm showing quickly my uh, our results, but um, next picture after me is a PhD student Ashutosh who will tell you more about the results we found for for uh, uh, carbon, oxygen, magnesium, and silicon. Uh, here I just want to mention that blue and the red dots are the same, the, the stars that has no, no planets, and the colored ones are the data for stars who has planets. And from the just first glance, we can see that the carbon is uh, similar for both planet hosts and planets that do, uh, the stars that do not host planets. And the same is uh, uh, visible for uh, uh, nitrogen and and oxygen. We see nice correlation uh, uh, due to uh, chemical evolution of, of oxygen. As I mentioned, we derived uh, a full and a homogeneous catalog for host stars, and we will analyze uh, different color correlations. One of the possible correlation to ex ex uh, examine examine is uh, planetary mass. Is there any dependence of the host uh, uh, parameter to planet mass that we uh, see in, in the system? And also we can study dynamical history of stars that might impact the distribution and the architecture of the planets they host. Uh, and um, there will be more results to follow. So thank you for your attention. I think that there are too many questions. Uh, this is, uh, oh, <laughs> I think that probably there are too many questions for you raised in this presentation because uh, research uh, on exoplanets and exoplanet host stars uh, is just uh, uh, emerging and uh, everybody <laughs> has many questions. So, but still. Okay, then now we will listen. Are oh, you have? Yes, mm. please. I, I saw that in, in one slide you talk about micro turbulence velocity. Yes. Does it has a relation with the presence of uh, exoplanets or is it uh, independent? Um, probably it does not. We never checked if uh, uh, it does, but. Uh, my my the answer to my, we will investigate yeah <laughs> but my answer probably it's not it's a micro micro parameter that we adjust uh, to to the spectra so
it is not uh, so easy to investigate uh, this influence, but uh, when the uh, exoplanet falls to a star, its composition may change or something like that. So such <laughs> impacts uh, could be visible. Okay, thank you, Edita. And now uh, we will uh, hear a presentation uh, by Ashutosh Sharma from the Vilnius University. He is a PhD student of Edita, so he will say something more about this. <clears throat> uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashutosh Sharma, and I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Theoretical Physics and Astronomy, Vilnius University. And uh, today I'm going to <clears throat> present our research work that we did uh, uh, with a collaborative endeavor with uh, esteemed professors, professors and uh, senior researchers from our group. And together we have worked on this project, which is titled uh, Probing or Investigating the Carbon to Oxygen and magnesium to silicon elemental ratios in stars which are harboring planets. So this is a little introduction about stars with planets, why we need to study stars with planets in context with the star-planet connection. So as of now, uh, as of June 22, uh, 2023, uh, more than 5,400 planets have been discovered, around <clears throat> 4,056 stars. And uh, the discovery of these exoplanets in recent years has revolutionized the way we were understanding the formation, the composition, and the evaluation of uh, planetary uh, planets. And uh, <clears throat> several studies have reported that uh, uh, the characterization of planet host, uh, host stars <clears throat> can help us uh, in determining, uh, with high precision, the characterization of planet host stars uh, can help us in determining the physical and chemical composition of protoplanetary disks uh, from, uh, or, or from which these planets form. Uh, and uh, when, uh, when we have uh, the uh, planet properties, comparing these planet properties to the models of uh, planetary interiors, uh, they can give us uh, uh, clues on what type of planet has been detected. And apart from determining the precise planet properties, uh, the study of uh, exoplanet hosts with high precision can also help us in determining the location of the habitable zone and can also constrain the favorable conditions for planet formation. <clears throat> so here is the aim of the work. Uh, uh, the main aim of the work is to investigate the carbon to oxygen and magnesium to silicon elemental ratios of stars that are hosting planets. Uh, why, this, uh, why these elemental ratios are important to study? Uh, <clears throat> uh, several studies have suggested that these ratios have uh, pro pro provided with a greater insights into the formation, evolution, and composition of, uh, of, of, of uh, planets <clears throat> because they tell us about the processes that are involved in the planet formation. And uh, they can also decipher us, uh, they can also help us in decipher the chemical composition of uh, planetary atmospheres uh, and interiors. Uh, so these are the reasons why these, uh, the study of these elements are important. Uh, so to accomplish the aim of this work, we did two main tasks. Uh, uh, first one is to determine the main atmospheric parameters for plan planet hosts, uh, and these parameters include effective temperature. Uh, this tem the effective temperature can be defined as the temperature of uh, a theoretical black body, which is emitting the same amount of energy as uh, is emitted by a star. Then we have surface gravity, which is defined as the gravity of the star in a logarithmic scale. Uh, then we have microturbulence velocity, uh, which is used in stellar uh, spectroscopy to <clears throat> account for the small scale turbulent motions in the star's atmosphere. Uh, so this is basically the random velocity distributions that occur in micro scale <laughs> and uh, that impact the line broadening of uh, uh, or that observed in stellar spectra. And then we have the metallicity, which is the abundance of iron uh, in the star relative to hydrogen. Uh, once we have the, uh, our main atmospheric parameters done, uh, the next step is to determine the chemical elemental abundances. And since uh, in this work, we are investigating the carbon to oxygen and magnesium to silicon ratios, uh, 
uh, in, the, uh, in this work, we are determining the <clears throat> abundances of carbon, oxygen, magnesium, and silicon. So here is the observation of, um, data. Uh, in this work, we are dedicated to 131 uh, bright exoplanet hosts that are taken from the list of tests, which is a transiting exoplanet survey satellite. It's a space mission that is dedicated to the discovery of exoplanets. And all our, plan uh, all our <clears throat> stars in the sample have a visual magnitude of less than eight. And observations are carried out with that 1.65 meter telescope. You can see the specifications of, tele of the telescope in the table. <clears throat> and uh, this telescope uh, is installed at Molotai Astronomical Observatory in Lithuania, uh, in Molotai, Lithuania. And it's a facility that belongs to uh, Europlanet Telescope Network. And, uh, and this telescope is equipped with a high, re very high resolution Vilnius University Ischel spectrograph from which we got the spectra of the stars that we have uh, had observed. Uh, and this, uh, uh, this uh, spectrograph has a resolving power of 30,000, 45,000, and 60,000. And it works in the wavelength range from 400 to 900 nanometers. And as, uh, <clears throat> And for this work, uh, the Europlanet Telescope Network had awarded 17 plus 15 nights for us to observe the stars which are hosting planets at the Molotai Astronomical Observatory. And, and, and as Dr. Edita said, we are <clears throat> currently working on the data analysis of the stars that we have already observed. So here, I, uh, as I told before, the main tasks were uh, to, uh, the first main task was to determine the atmospheric parameters. Here, I, I will tell you uh, in detail how we uh, determine these parameters. So <clears throat> in this case, in our work, we determine uniformly. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Sure, 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 ma'am. Uh, so we uh, we determine the atmospheric parameters of a star using the classical equivalent width approach. In this approach, uh, we measure the equivalent widths of atomic neutral and ionized lines. And uh, using a combination of these uh, programs called DAOSPEC and MOOG, and once we have the uh, once we have measured the equivalent widths of the uh, of the iron lines, the next step is to measure the to evaluate the abundances of uh, iron abundance of iron for these lines <clears throat> and uh, once we have the abundance of iron for uh, neutral and neutral and ionized lines the uh, uh, the final step is to determine the parameters and uh, uh, to, for determining air effective temperature we see that temperature value uh, when there is uh, where there is no trend of neutral iron absorption line with the excitation potential of the lines and to determine the surface gravity, we see the ionization balance of uh, the neutral and ionized iron lines, iron abundances. And for micro turbulence velocity, we see if there is any, if there is no abundance trend on the absorption line uh, <clears throat> strength. And uh, when we have calculated all three parameters, we will uh, have a final uh, uh, abundance value for iron and by uh, through which we calculate the final metallicity value. Uh, <clears throat> once we have the atmospheric parameters, we calculate the uh, chemical element abundances. And since we are here uh, calculating uh, the abundances of carbon, oxygen, magnesium, and silicon, we did this uh, using uh, this spectral synthesis method uh, with the program called TurboSpectrum. In this method, what we do, we compare the observed spectra with the, <clears throat> uh, with the synthetic spectra that is generated by the program. Uh, uh, but but the first step is to select the lines that we are going to use to uh, to compare the spectra. So here you can see for magnesium we have, have selected up to four atomic uh, spectral lines. For silicon we have selected up to eleven lines. For carbon we have two molecular carbon lines. As you can see in the figure, one is situated at uh, five thousand three hundred and thirty-five angstrom. And second one is uh, situated at 5,635 angstrom. <clears throat> and we have a, a forbidden oxygen line as well at 6,300 <clears throat> angstrom. 
and all these lines were selected or uh, the atomic lines were selected from the guy ISO line list. So once we have selected the line list, the next step is to uh, <clears throat> use the spectral synthesis method. So let's say uh, we are <clears throat> finding the abundance of carbon. We have two carbon lines. We will compare the spect original spectra, uh, the lines of original spectra and the sit synthetic spectra for these lines. Uh, as you can see in the figure, the black dots, uh, the black uh, line is the observed spectra and the colored red line is the uh, synthetic spectra. And once we have nicely matched, the, match the, <clears throat> the, the, the software will give us the abundance for, of carbon for that line. And uh, <clears throat> uh, the total abundance of carbon will be the uh, average of the abundance of both the lines. Uh, now, since we have talked uh, a lot about stars, it's time to talk a little about planets in our sample. So the data on the planets uh, are take, uh, that are present in our sample are taken from this online database called NASA Exoplanet Archive. Uh, this is an archive from NASA, which, uh, <coughs> which can, oh, sorry. Uh, this is a uh, archive from NASA, which contains all the data of the exoplanetary systems. As you can see here, this number 5419, uh, it's the number that, uh, it's the um, uh, total number of planets that are already been com confirmed till date. Uh, it, it, this is a link, if you will click on the link, uh, you will get the data of all these exoplanetary systems that are confirmed. And if I want to have the data of a specific exoplanet, I'll write the name of the uh, host star that, uh, that is hosting that exoplanet. And I'll click on the search button and that will <clears throat> show me the uh, data of that specific host planet. So that's how we got the data of uh, our planets in our um, sample. Uh, here I have plotted few graphs to check uh, uh, what kind of planets we are having in our sample. So you can see in the pie chart, uh, uh, the most of the planets in our sample are gas giants. Around 80% of uh, our planets of the planets that are in the sample are gas giants. <clears throat> then we have Neptune-like planets, which are around 12.5% in the sample. Then we have super Earths, which are 4.8%, and then terrestrial, which are 2.4% in the sample. So, and also we have a total uh, sam a total uh, sample of planet uh, planets uh, 174, which are, are orbiting around 131 host stars. And uh, here I have plotted these planets uh, in the planet mass versus uh, orbital period uh, uh, graph, uh, where these planets are color coded <clears throat> according to their type. As you can see, the blue corresponds to the gas, gas giants, the orange are the Neptune-like, then we have uh, super Earths in gray dots, and then we have uh, uh, terrestrial in yellow dots. And this horizontal line indicates uh, uh, where uh, these horizontal lines, these indicates where in this plot, uh, Earth, Neptune, and Jupiter of our solar system will lie. And in, in the bar plot, you can see the, uh, the, the number of uh, planets of different masses in our sample. So here I try to plot uh, the, gra uh, the stars of our sample to check the distributions of uh, dwarfs and giants. And uh, as you can see, we have a very clear distribution of dwarfs and giants in our sample. And in fact, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the number of dwarfs and giants in our so uh, sample seems to be almost equal. And to be very specific, we have a sample of <clears throat> 71 dwarfs and 60 giant planet hosts. And in this table, you can see the maximum, the minimum, the maximum value, the minimum value, the mean value, and the mean of the error values of all the, <clears throat> all the uh, uh, atmospheric parameters of our star. Uh, as you can see, uh, our, uh, our stars of our sample lies in the metallicity range from 0 0.76 to 0 0.45, which means that our sample has uh, both metal rich and metal poor stars. And our stars are our stars. Our, the sam, our sample has have uh, cooler stars till three thousand nine hundred and sixty three uh, Kelvin, and hotter stars like six uh, with six thousand six hundred and seventy five Kelvin. So this just shows the range how uh, <clears throat> of our stars in the uh, in the uh, atmospheric parameter scale. 
So here are the results that are showing the distribution of carbon to oxygen and magnesium to silicon as a function of metallicity. Uh, in the figure, I have uh, plotted uh, 131 planet hosts from this work, and I have compared these planet hosts from 740 non-planet hosts that are taken from the recent work done by Professor Tot Vishene. Uh, <clears throat> and I have all uh, here in the figure, you can see the yellow and green uh, circles they represent the giant and dwarf planet hosts from this work uh, respectively and blue and uh, red circles they represents the non-planet host from south Vishyane work uh, <clears throat> now you can see from the figure that uh, these planet hosts they seems to be more on the metal rich side uh, which uh, is in accordance with the statement that uh, planets tend to form near metal rich stars uh, now, if you will see on the distribution of carbon to oxygen, you will uh, you will observe that uh, the stars in our sample has uh, the uh, CO distribution of not more than 0 0.8, which means that uh, in all, all the stars in our sample have, have a, a larger amount of oxygen than carbon, and this can lead to the formation of oxygen-rich planets like Jupiter. Mm, but this can't be considered as the only criteria. Uh, because there are m much more criteria there. <clears throat> uh, also, you can see these uh, metal-rich dwarf hosts, these yellow circles, yellow dots, they have higher uh, concentrate, higher CO distribution than metal-poor dwarfs. Uh, now, if we go to the magnesium to silicon distribution, uh, we can observe that uh, on, an, on the average, these distribution seems to be slightly lower in stars with planets, which means that <clears throat> the, the the stars in our sample ha are more silicon rich than uh, the non-planet hosts that I uh, considered here for comparison. Uh, here, uh, here's the second result, uh, which is showing the distribution of carbon oxygen and magnesium to silicon as a function of planet mass in the figure the green and blue green and violet circles represents the planet host from this work and gray circles represents the planet host from the work uh, the recent work by uh, professor totvishene and uh, to check any trend if these uh, <clears throat> if these uh, stars uh, follow in those distributions i have computed the linear fit for this work and uh, for also for the all for the overall stars for comparison and uh, uh, you can see from the linear fit that uh, in the CO distribution for dwarf hosts, there is a slight uh, negative CO slope towards the stars which are hosting high mass planets, uh, which means that uh, <clears throat> the uh, the uh, dwarfs which are hosting high mass planets have less CO uh, concentr uh, less CO distribution than those which are hosting high mass planets. And uh, similar cases for uh, uh, magnesium to silicon distribution, where uh, uh, we can see uh, there is a negative magnesium to silicon slope towards the star hosting high mass planets, which means that uh, those stars which uh, in our sample, which are hosting high mass planets, have also lesser uh, Mg over Si distribution uh, compared to those stars which are hosting low mass, uh, <clears throat> low mass planets. So this is it. Thank you so much for your attention. Do you have questions? So as you can see, everything it is possible to learn. <laughs> well, one question. Mm, yeah, thank you for your presentation. It was really nice. Um, it's probably going to be a really basic question, but I'm not really familiar with exoplanets. So it's regarding these two ratios that you're analyzing. Mm -hmm. Are these two the let's say, most important ones, or are there others that you, these uh, should be important to analyze as well? Like these are one of the criteria that we can consider to uh, study the uh, the form the star planet connection. But there are always other criteria that we need to study to learn more about these uh, star planet connections. All right, thank you. You're welcome. Ricardo? 
Yes, very nice talk, and uh, also with lots of observations from uh, the telescope and uh, the European Telescope Network. Um, so my question is more about uh, the comparison with Jupiter, because even in, in Jupiter, we are not sure about the C versus O ratio. It's something that is under debate. We are, that's a quantity that we don't know for Jupiter, and there are some people working on that debate, so maybe later we can, we can talk about it. But it's, um, even in this, our solar system, we don't understand this, this question. So it's, mm -hmm. uh, it's good to have uh, statistics from other different exoplanets. And so this is a work that probably will have connections in different fields. So uh, very interesting talk. Thank you. Thank you, Ricardo. So we should thank you, Ashutosh, and move uh, to another presentation. Thank you. So now we will uh, hear a presentation uh, by Mahomet uh, Talavga. And uh, this presentation uh, is related to, okay. to solar activity and uh, its impact uh, to planets. So our sun now is rising to its activity maximum. So, <laughs> and uh, of course, uh, also for other exoplanet uh, systems, it is important that stars uh, should be not very active, uh, that uh, life could be preserved <laughs> uh, on exoplanets. So you are welcome. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, I'm Mohamed Rafa. I'm a postdoc at uh, Wigner Research Center at Budapest. I'm working with Andy Riopit. We are uh, doing some simulation for the... Thanks. Uh, simulation for the solar cycle. So I'll be talking about uh, some introduction about the activities from the solar cycle and its effects on the different planets on different scales. So to start with, this is uh, the main processes that to occur uh, during the solar cycle. So we start usually with uh, a poloidal field in one direction. Then using differential rotation, we went up with the, the poloidal field, uh, which is uh, we call the omega effect. Then going up there with the alpha uh, alpha effect, we can see this uh, small uh, poloidal field goes back to a reverse poloidal field as a larger scale. And down here, we can see the back Plato mechanism. Uh, Where is this? Uh, flux tubes uh, buoyantly rise to the surface and uh, this flux tube uh, move to, toward the poles with the meridian flow and uh, forming the new uh, uh, poloidal field in the opposite direction to the initial one. So basically these are the, the main processes that we, we think that occur during the solar cycle. And uh, it's important to, uh, to know how these processes occur especially in the second part. Now more attention coming there. And uh, we found two uh, basic, basically two nonlinearities affecting this, uh, this uh, 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 or, or processes that occur here. So we have, uh, we have noticed something we call tilt quenching and latitude quenching, which can affect the, uh, the solar dynamo uh, as a whole. And uh, now we are inv investigating the meridian flow perturbation. If, so if we introduce perturbation to the meridian flow uh, here in this one, if we introduce perturbation, how this can affect the whole dynamo. Okay. Uh, so we have, basically we have uh, several events that occur because of the magnetic solar cycle. And we usually focus on sunspots. We focus on uh, CMEs, coronal mass ejections. We focus on solar wind also, and coronal holes and solar flares. Uh, the most interesting for, for myself is sunspots and the solar wind. So why sunspots? Sunspot is important for, <coughs> sorry. Uh, sunspot is very important for uh, studying the the magnetic uh, the magnetic field of the sun from Earth, and solar wind is very important to to know how the sun affects other planets. 
So it's for for myself, it's uh, very interesting to to know which uh, how these two effects uh, affect the different plants. So uh, back to the sunspot. So we have uh, we have here uh, we can see the active uh, region built, and we can see the sunspots here. And uh, maybe most of us know that uh, the sunspot is uh, a compound of uh, ampra and penampra, and we have some pores. And when the sun uh, have differential rotation, then we can see this form, which was uh, what we call the butterfly diagram. As here, we can see the the sunspot position with time and uh, with latitude. So we can form this kind of uh, mass plot, the butterfly diagram. And this is occurred during the solar cycle. So we have this solar cycle brought back from 1880 to current time. And we have the numbers of the solar cycle. And this is a lot like on y axis is the sunspot area. Okay, and uh, now the magnetic field affect uh, on different aspects. So we have uh, astronaut radiation, we have uh, radiation damage on satellite, we have navigation errors. This is on uh, on the uh, Earth uh, field, and we have uh, we have also different. Uh, effect, as we can see, uh, from the the particle, the solar particles, and from the solar wind also. Okay, uh, what about Mars? So uh, for Mars, uh, the solar activity uh, influenced the the atmosphere, the the Mars atmosphere, and uh, we can we can know this from the solar wind, and uh, when we notice the the the, the Mars atmosphere during the maximum, the solar maximum, then we can see that uh, the whole uh, atmosphere of the Mars is compressed. We can see some dust storms on Mars. Uh, we can also, um, this, this storm also can, uh, solar storm can pose risk to future missions. So it's very important to know. And this is uh, basically some kind of simulation for, for Mars and how it's affected by the solar wind protons. And we can see it somehow compressed the, the whole uh, atmosphere uh, as overall. Okay. On the outer planets, we have an example of Jupiter. And... Uh, uh, the, the solar cycle is limited, so we may notice the the effect of the of the solar cycle during the maximum the maximum uh, of the solar cycle. We can see the 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 nice aurora here at the poles. So because because it's far away, so we we basically we don't know that much about uh, what occur or how it affects, uh, but we can notice that of course. And uh, the variation in solar activity can influence the intensity and distribution of this uh, oral emission. So we 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 know that these are existed. Okay, uh, for exoplanets, uh, it's important to know to uh, to study the the effect on exoplanets. However, it's very uh, very low uh, effect from the solar cycle, uh, but we can consider the the high energy particles uh, from uh, stellar activity, and we we can also uh, apply the same for different stars. So we are studying the sun, but we can apply the same principle for uh, different stars affecting on different exoplanets. Uh, so for this, and to conclude. We have uh, the solar cycle has significant effect uh, on a plant in solar system. Uh, Earth experience change in climate, satellite operation, and communication system. Uh, Mars undergo atmosphere and climate variation. Outer plants and exoplanets are uh, influenced to a lesser uh, extent and still experience some effects. And further research is needed to fully understand the implication of solar activity on exoplanet. Uh, with this in conclusion, I stop here.
and thank you for listening. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. So, do we have uh, questions? Well, let's be aware about solar activity. <laughs> so, thank you very much. Thank you. So, our next uh, speaker is uh, Florence Lubote. She will uh, tell us uh, about her experience of two years uh, already observations on the Europlanet Telescope uh, Network uh, Telescopes. Uh, she is uh, our prominent amateur working <laughs> on the network. Mm -hmm. So, okay, first of all, um, I would like to thank uh, Europlanet organization to invite me to share with all of you my experience and experience, not only mine, but uh, of the whole group. You see all those names. Mexe uh, Korea has been a fellow at the very beginning of this uh, experience, and some uh, new people have been added to the group. Now we are even uh, more, some more. Well, we are observer, we are amateur observers, uh, concretely from uh, Sabade, that is close to Barcelona. Here you can see the, the observatory in, inside the park and also the, the telescope that I use to mainly for variable star, uh, <clears throat> that's my background. When the Europlanet uh, telescope, maybe I won't be long as uh, Grazina has explained to you uh, much more than I could do now, so you know the the existence. This is the web page where you can find all the information of uh, of the telescope that are available on on this network with all the detail that you can you can need in order to to choose the one you want to to use. So, how did we get involved in uh, in this project? Well, it began uh, two years ago with a workshop. It was a workshop organized by the Spanish and uh, Portugal hub. The people are here, Ricardo Oveso, Inizia also. <laughs> they are here, bo both of them. It was uh, organized online, of course, because it was during the COVID pandemic. So, uh, but where the objective were uh, to learn how to use the European uh, telescope network, how amateur we could use it also uh, how to to access the network how to apply for time and uh, that was a, a practical session in uh, Calaralto in the south of spain so this was the first uh, result let's say you can see images that we get that night in uh, 2021 and you have also um, an image of uh, the telescope it's a 1.23 uh, meter telescope, as you see uh, here below. And we got uh, one exoplanet transit, at least one. So the night was very, very uh, productive. And then day we also uh, could observe comets, and there were other people in the group. I think we were maybe 50 or 70 people connected for this session. So, well, after this workshop, uh, Mercedes Correa and myself, we said, well, well, we have to try and uh, let's go. At the time, we were already uh, collaborating with the ExoClock project. Tomorrow, we will have a complete, uh, almost complete day <laughs> with uh, Anastasia to talk about this, uh, this project. What is uh, the, its uh, major characteristic? It's a uh, projects that is born for amateur and professional to collaborate uh, together. This is very, very important. The Ariel mission, uh, you probably may all, all know what is the, um, the objective, is to study the atmospheres, specifically the atmosphere of exoplanet. Its aim is not to find new exoplanet, but to, to study this part. Ariel means, uh, I al always have to, to read it, atmospheric remote sensing infrared exoplanets large survey so it's a very ambitious uh, mission from the from the ESA and uh, so well uh, what needs uh, exoclock and Ariane mission it needs a very precise uh, ephemeris of uh, transit of exoplanets and so that's where the amateur people we can help uh, a lot that's what we try here you can see 
Mm -hmm. And you can see some OC diagram. You see, sometimes, um, sometimes there are many observations already from different uh, sources. It can be um, from Exoclock itself, from uh, ETD webpage, also from space. But sometimes, like uh, in the, in the other case, there is only one point. I'm proud of it because uh, it's uh, our group, one of our group points. Uh, financed also by by Europlanet. And uh, why is it so difficult? Well, because it's not very easy. It's not easy at all to observe uh, exoplanet uh, transits because the depth of uh, the light curves is uh, very small. Because as you can see, sometimes there are very few observations. And so uh, it's very useful. That's why. We apply for time on the Europlanet Telescope Network, specifically in the IEC 80 that is located in uh, Tenerife, in uh, in Spain. So, well, the first observation that we made was in October 2021. Oh, uh, Gazina, how long? How many time? <laughs> well, okay, you you tell me. Okay, so. Um, that was our first experience. We get the approval first from the IAC to observe at night. Then we request the, the financing to Europlanet. We wrote the document in English. It was a first experience. Then, of course, the most funny part is to observe, to analyze, then to write the report and send it to, to the Europlanet. Of course, it was a remote observation, so we connected by Zoom with the support astronomer of the IAC at that time. But well, we, we plan to observe two exoplanets. The first one, the first transit was uh, impossible to catch, so we forget it. But the second one, yes, was positive. It's the, this one is WASP-156b, uh, as you can see. We were very, very happy, indeed, <laughs> to get this. But well, what was also a surprise for us is that also the people uh, from the IEC were surprised by that result. And so they sent us an email uh, from the IEC uh, management telling us, well, could we use your curve to publish a photo, not, uh, photo news in our web page? <laughs> what? <laughs> the IEC? <laughs> And yes, uh, here you can see it. Um, this is on the web page of the IC still today. If you check in Photo News uh, Exoplanet, you will find uh, our our curve. Well, then uh, second experience. Um, could we travel to the observatory? We were wanting to go and live uh, directly a night there. And so yes, uh, by chance we had two nights, two different proposals that were accepted two consecutive nights, one uh, colleague and one fellow and uh, myself. And of course, you see those two children. <laughs> we were living really a, a dream for us is to be in the Tenerife, in the Tede, just close to, to, the, um, to the telescope. And we lived there with the, the, the people from the IC. It was a real amazing experience that offered to us by European organization. So we had uh, positive transits also. I think we had three uh, exoplanet transits in, uh, in tonight. And um, I must say that the Europlanet did pay everything for uh, every kind of cost. Moreover, so over the dream, this. Well, at the end for the group, here you can see in, in one shot all our transits that are published in the ExoClock uh, webpage. Eight nights uh, fully funded by uh, Europlanet. This was the figure at the end of uh, April. We have this sheet of uh, follow-up where we write well, the, the measurement, the date that we observe. Also, in order to compare and to help for future observation, the, um, the exposure time, the magnitude of the star, the comments on the night, or what, what can be uh, useful. So sometimes we are asked for uh, success. Well, uh, we made um, a calculation. This would be the, the summary. Well, positive uh, uh, observation, we are around 71%, 71. Negative, directly negative, around 20%. 
and uh, still pending that means that the, the, the curve is not clear or we still have to check sometimes uh, mainly from the IAC we have dust in the atmosphere so it makes sometimes difficult the, the photometry afterwards and then the last but not least um, not only observing but uh, we uh, we finished this talk with the, um, another workshop that took place here in Calar Alto and it was uh, only two weeks ago we had three nights training on the observatory of um, 1.2 it's not this one it's a, but it's this observatory 1.2 meter telescope the meaning there was to teach us how to use remotely uh, this telescope you can see here a picture of uh, the group we were i don't know maybe uh, almost 20 person i guess no ricardo so, something like that <laughs> This is a, a nice pic of, uh, of the telescope. For, for us, it's just amazing. It's a huge telescope to be, to be allowed you know, to, to use this. It's a, it's a dream again. And then um, you can see in the, first, in the first image, there were clouds. When the clouds, they did not leave us almost any moment. So the last uh, picture you can see in the um, the dome is open for us it was uh, an event because we had a really bad bad weather this is located in the south of spain so we could not imagine that could happen okay so this is uh, some images of this uh, workshop here you can first see how we were working all together in the rather small room we were people from uh, all spain and also one person uh, from uh, portugal to be to be there here you see um what is the weather check screen for um for the calaralto observatory we were looking at that maybe too much because the weather was really really bad yes it's yeah is laughing but uh, well but finally we could uh, we could open the dome uh, twice uh, on saturday two hours and on sunday another two hours that was it in three nights but well we did some uh, images of course the next planet in this situation was not possible to to observe but yes we observe uh, comets and uh, asteroids as you can see it was a new ccd a ccd under commissioning so also it was interesting for the for the team to get information on how this uh, ccd was working it works at um, 50 degrees under zero as you as you can see so finally um well that's it, it actually if you see here <laughs> this is funny because um, here i say three night training when I revised my presentation this noon, I had forgotten the T. So you had three nights raining. <laughs> it's a little bit exaggerated, but I said, no, I, I can't believe it. But we so conclusion. Um, we had uh, two wonderful uh, workshops on the Calaralto. We also saw free use of professional telescopes. That's a wonderful opportunity that amateurs are having until, well, until the, it finishes or, or, or we'll see. In our case, uh, we had eight nights uh, financed and supported by, by Europlanet. And of course, the experience is to be continued. I would uh, give a special thanks to the Europlanet organization, to the Hub of Spain, uh, Ricardo and uh, Itia, also to Grazina here that uh, help us so much. Also thanks to uh, the Observatory of the Teide that sometimes uh, help us also very much through the uh, support astronomers. And also to uh, the team of ExoClock that is um, Anastasia that he presents. So thank you for this wonderful experience. I hope that I could transmit to you our enthusiasm as an amateur to use this, uh, this opportunity of a European Telescope Network. That's it, thank you. Be sure, uh, Florence, you transmitted your uh, enthusiasm <laughs> for us. 
and uh, we are very glad uh, you had an uh, enjoyable time <laughs> observing and investigating and uh, if uh, you could compare what uh, the representations of our materials at uh, the first workshop and now we see a, a large uh, growth of knowledges and <laughs> this is very very good and uh, we are very glad so do you have uh, questions yes ricardo have a comment because uh, my experience working with amateurs is that these people have thousands of hours of experience doing observations with their own telescopes and in every single event that i organize it with them i think i am the one that learns the most uh, that <laughs> those nights we were observing asteroids which is not my field and i was absolutely impressed about the way to work analyze the data reduce improve the observations and finally get the results it was really a good experience and i invite people that is close to amateurs to try to develop things with them and, and you see that the clear examples of the, this is worth it. Yes, I think that community of uh, asteroid comet observations uh, among uh, astro amateur astronomers is larger. So we should grow community of uh, exoplanet observers uh, now. So thank you very much. <laughs> And uh, now uh, our last talk also will be given by the amateur astronomer Andrea Kovacs. Uh, he will present uh, his talk uh, uh, online. Hello, everyone. I'm Andrea Kovacs. I'm a member of VGVSU, uh, where I contribute mainly with uh, follow up observations of transit exoplanets like Florence. And first of all, I would like to thank Regina and the Aeroplanet Society for this wonderful opportunity to present in this workshop. And to the Molotai Astronomical Observatory, the Vilnius University and AVSO for all the support. Uh, here is the agenda for this presentation. And in this presentation, <clears throat> I'm going to give an overview of, of the workflow that, and the tools that we used for the follow-up using the Monetai Observatory via the European Telescope Network. And the agenda consists of overview of the infrastructure, major steps that we uh, do in the workflow, and other and also interesting results and some takeaways from the experience. Uh, as Gagino already explained a bit, uh, the telescope at the Molotai Observatory, uh, the Vilnius University, uh, we use the 31 centimeter telescope. It's about 14 inches in aperture. Uh, it's generally operated remotely and it uses an Apogee Alta U47 CCD camera. And we, we mainly use the R Cousins uh, photometric filter for our observations, but sometimes for more difficult targets, we are also use the clear filter. And the location of the observatory is really good. It's under Borto class four. Uh, has some uh, by light that we are currently facing uh, there. Uh, for those interested in, in using the European Telescope Network for observations, um, our planning was mainly based on the ExoWorld SPICE transit schedule provided by the ExoClock project. And they have a interesting prioritization system of the targets as already Florence explained it. And it's also uh, tries to uh, highlight some targets for the specific aperture of your telescope. So it's really, really helpful. It also helps because it, it, you can customize the horizon 
altitude that you have in your, in your observatory, so you can filter out many uh, unobservable transits. But it's uh, mainly focusing on in the area target list and cannot provide uh, transit information for other targets. So in those situations, you probably will need to you use another tool. And we use uh, this fourth mode, transit find service, and it can provide different targets, but we our fo focus were more on the exaclock targets. And it also helped a lot to fine tune the day and night definition, especially for astronomical twilight that we have the red light right now there at Molotai. And also to filter out uh, observations during uh, full moon and when the moon was too close to the target. So this was really helpful in our planning. And the observing part, as others already explained it, uh, you need to submit poses. And in specifically for the Molotai, we need to submit a specific proposal to Molotai and that has this uh, fixed cycle per quarter period that has a deadline of 30 days before the, the, the cycle and they try to answer the, the proposal uh, 15 days after the deadline. Besides that, we needed to submit another proposal to the European Task Network for funding. Uh, it was submitted per semester, and they usually uh, give reviews after two months after the submission. As already said, uh, our target selection was based mainly on the exoclock clock project targets and using their prioritization system. Uh, and the aim was to do uh, transit timing and studies in support to the exoclock clock project. And in our proposals, we tried to provide a May program with our high priority and mid priority targets, but also we provided a backup program in case of technical issues or, or weather and so on. And the service observations were provided by the Molotai and then and operated by Dr. Erika Pakistian, and that was our co investigator. She's a senior researcher at the Business University, and she she was a liaison with the observatory technical staff, and he knows all the all the equipment and everything there. So it was really helpful. I cannot thank her enough. And uh, our work interaction work was mainly uh, using monthly review observations plans and where we try to characterize the system in advance to provide some suggested integration times for targets. And, but we had to evaluate the, the conditions per night, right? So she was, uh, we were in, interacting each night to evaluate and select which target to, should be more suitable for the conditions that we use. As already said, uh, we did a, a previous uh, study of and characterization of the telescope, so we could evaluate the integration times and also to select specific targets for observing, observing with the R Cousins filter or the clear filter for the more uh, challenging ones. And uh, for our analysis, we focus mainly using the Astro image they provide uh, by Karen Collins. And we did uh, the image calibration using it, right? And also the data reduction. The data reduction uh, from AIJ is outstanding. It's, uh, the, it's the most complete tool that I found. And it has the capability to use, comes from different 
uh, sources like AVSO, final charts, or automatic comps by, based on brightness of the target. It also can automatically have, uh, adjust uh, the aperture size for the photometry, for the rather profile of the of the target. Also, we can do variable aperture photometry for the situations more challenging, like uh, when you have uh, scene variations. Uh, it can do also automatic comp star selections uh, for the ensemble. And one thing that we found really interesting was the sigma clipping that we use a lot to remove outliers. And another feature that uh, is hard to find in other tools is the detraining of the Likert, where we could uh, fix some air mass problems or linear trends in the data and other uh, situations or roundness of the target. Um, but the, the, the part that's not so great in the tool is the transit modified because it, it uses a simple chi-square minimization and cannot provide uncertain things for the the transit parameters. So uh, what we did instead was to use the, the feature uh, in AIJ to export the data using bicentric Julian days or heliocentric Julian days. So we could use, could use other tools to do more advanced fitting. So one main tool that we used was the exoclock uh, project version, online version of HOPS by by the project and it provides a, a more complete uh, transmod fit as Florence already presented and it does uh, MCMC sampling. So it can provide uncertainties for the parameters, right? And also other features that are outstand outstanding is the, the fit, is, fit diagnostic metrics like transit SNR, uh, the drift of the transit depth, also the O minus C chart, and we have other tests also for some systematics. And also, they, as you submit your data to the Exoclock project, they evaluate those metrics and provide some uh, tips on how to improve our results that are really helpful uh, when you are analyzing your data. For reporting, we, we try to report to as many databases available for our amateurs as we could, right? So the first one was uh, clearly the Exoclock project, right? Where they use the hops. And also when you submit many uh, transits to the Exoclock project, they can compute a, an FT effective telescope aperture for your specific telescope. So in our case, instead of 14 inches in average, uh, we could achieve for our uh, good results uh, around 21 inches in aperture, in that effective aperture. Also, they provide a, a a ascending metric that's called the transit SNR. So you can have evaluate if your light curve is good or not. And they uh, try to accept um, only uh, transits that have uh, uh, transit SNR above uh, three or, and, or uh, usually above five for the good ones, right? And also we submit our data to the exoplanet, uh, exoplanet transit database from the Czech Astronomical Society. And to submit data to them, we need to submit to the Tresca database, but their model fitting is not that great as the exoplanet project because they do only a nonlinear least squares fit to your data. But we found that 
an interesting metric was the data quality index so that was more easy easier to use because it it ranks only from one to five so you can evaluate uh, one being the the nicest one and five being the the poorest one right and as a member of VSO, AVSO, I also submit all our observations to the AVSO Exoplanet database that feeds the NASA uh, Exoplanet Watch project that uh, is coordinated by Robert Zelling and uses the exotic uh, tool that is pretty similar to the HOPS used by the Exopocket project. And uh, also an, an interesting thing that some of you might be interested is to is that it can also accept outside of transit observations when you do some uh, testing or you want to uh, you have some issues with the timing and they can accept your observations instead of only complete transits and some interesting results uh, this is uh, a trend for our trace to be uh, that is a, a medium uh, difficulty target and was observed under ideal conditions. As you can see in this, this plot from Asterix image A, we had a, a, an outstanding uh, photometric precision around two parts per thousand in this target, and this was the 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 target that we set for the system. We we always try to, to achieve two parts per thousand for each observation, right? But it all depended on the, the, the conditions of each night. Uh, but as you can see, the, the, the trend was not complete because we had some issues with the weather, clouds, right, in this night, but the, the, the the plot was really clean, but the AIJ cannot provide some uh, other quality uh, evaluations on the target. So, so we also submitted to Exocock, right? And we had again around two parts per thousand error, and the transit SNR was th thirty-six. So, really high above the, the five uh, that they recommend for the target, right? And and we can see here also the, the evaluation of the transit timing that they provide. So our trans, uh, mid transit was here and with a variation of 2.5 minutes and with this small error. From ETD, uh, the fit was also uh, really nice, and the data quality metric that they provided was too, so really good also. And finally, for the Exoplanet Watch, uh, we can see that also they, they do a different fit using a beaming of the data points, right? But the, the result was really similar with a pretty small error. Uh, and here's some more challenging cases, right? And this one, the TOI 2109B, this is a kind of easier target, but we had some issues on the that particular night, and we could only observe until mid transit, right? So almost mid transit. We we actually won't don't have the mid transit in this thing. So was really trying to pull out this one, but uh, they, fortunately the the exoclock project uh, accepted our observation, and besides having a larger. Uh, error here and uh, and transient SNR of only three. So it was barely accept acceptable, right? And however, the ETD could not fit our partial transit without the mid time. So we cannot get the evaluation from ETD, but the exoclock, uh, the exoplanet watch 
projects are also accepted our observation and we can see that our errors were for the the census parameters were were a bit higher than than ideal and finally another one was the gj for 36b and it was this was also a medium difficulty target but we had to observe the under astronomical twilight a couple of weeks ago and it was really challenging to to pull out this one also and you can see here the 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 precision was kind of suffering um, almost at five parts per thousand and here from the exoclock project we can see that even this kind of noisy uh light curve we can get some good uh, transit mid time right so we can contribute uh, also when not under ideal conditions and with a snr of 11 right here again the for etd we can see that the data quality was uh, at four, so really suffering to 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 handle the scattering, the liker, right? And finally, the the exoplanet watch uh, feed, where we can see that we had a also a, a large uh, certainty in the parameters, but was a really acceptable in this case, right? So as takeaways. Um, I would like to point out that the transit observations present here using the 31 centimeter uh, telescope at model type uh, was a great opportunity to have access to professional uh, grading uh, equipment, right? And also I learned a lot from professional astronomers like uh, Dr. Erica, right? And and I would like to also to highlight the outstanding support from the, the, the audit team from the Molotai Astronomical Observatory and also Gregina and, and Erica for the, their uh, help with the proposals and the survey observations. And uh, also I would like to recommend all the to to interested in, in observing using the Europlan telescope, telescope a network to pay attention with, uh, to the planning phase because it's really crucial to select the most appropriate targets for your system you're trying to observe it, to uh, avoid having some frustrations right the observations and also have have a a main program and also a backup program in case of eventualities, right? Such weather or, or other situations that you might face and try to uh, revise your planning monthly, right? Uh, using the, your backup uh, selection of transits because you can have some situations where the, the priority of the target may might change from the exoplanet, uh, exoclock project or you can have might have some changes in the system and you need to adapt to those situations also additionally uh, uh, others to try to use more advanced tools like the AIJ to try to adjust the, the selection of comps because sometimes you you try to select a few comps around your target, but they they don't provide, for instance, the, a good uh, transit depth. But if you work nah, right uh, you um, in your comps, you can try to fix the situation. The exoclock feedback that they provide is really helpful in this. And also try to use uh, uh, also uh, some data points uh, if possible, right? Uh, using sigma clipping or, or manual manually removing the from your transit likers. Finally, uh, 
As I already said, the, the infrastructure provided by the Molotai was uh, outstanding. So we managed to achieve a, a, our target uh, automatic precision of two parts per thousand. Uh, that, that is uh, usually aimed for ground basis uh, observation under ideal conditions. And, and it was really sufficient for, for, uh, for this system and a really good match. So I will thank you. So thank you, Andre, for your sharing uh, of our experience. Uh, Andre made his presentations uh, from Brazil. So uh, I think that for Europe and amateur community, it would be good to, to go to have connections to, with other continents and to, to share experience, as you see. So do you have some question? One. Well, I, I understand that you did not come from uh, Brazil to uh, Moletai, or did you? No, we actually, uh, Erica did all the observations uh, using the uh, in the, the service mode that, uh, that Regina already explained is that many uh, telescopes provide from the, the telescope network. So she did all the observations and sent me uh, the images, right? The calibration image and the science image and I did the, the analysis and reporting from my side. Okay, so one more question. Uh, so thank you. Is it? Thank you, Andre, for your talk. Uh, it was very nice to compare all the websites. Uh, I have uh, one comment to to your uh, two hundred uh, no to two thousand hundred nine uh, toy uh, that failed to be uh, fitted in an ETD. I think uh, there was a problem if the expected time was too off from from expected it should be adjusted manually. So tr try that and it may work. But uh, thank you for also uploading the data to the ETD and all the all, right. all the work you have done. Thank you. All right, thank you. So thank you for Andre. Thank you for all the presenters at uh, this workshop. Uh, see you tomorrow and all the best for everybody.